my, my dad uh, first bought property in the town of Milan in 1958 from Harold Campbell on South Road. And as kids, um, my sisters and brothers and, and I were coming up here, you know, uh, from 1958 until um, 1968 when I had my house built. Moved in at the end of 1968, December of 1968, when I actually moved into my, my home. Milan uh, was my, my, as young kids, we were coming up to Ward Manor, which is near uh, Bard College. Uh, it was uh, a weekend retreat, usually, uh, and my family, cousins, aunts, uh, we all took cabins there for some, you know, going back in the early 50s for summers. and. Then uh, my dad was, uh, the Taconic had just been finished in 1958 and he was driving around and I guess he just took a drive past uh, the property where my house is now and saw it and uh, liked it and, you know, contacted, uh, I guess saw the sale sign on it and, and contacted Harold Campbell and, and, and bought it. He, he, in, in the early 60s he bought uh, some more property from the Jesse Langdon, which um, my mom eventually lived on, uh, which was adjoining mine. But um, uh, that, that happened in, I think, around the mid 60s before I actually built my house in 68. And Jess, Jesse Langdon um, was the last original Rough Rider uh, at, at, during his time. He died in the mid 70s, and um, he owned property on um, at the beginning of South Road. Most people know it's directly across from the entrance to the to the landfill. And, uh, he was uh, he was quite a quite a character. When you shook hands with him, it, 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 you, you were so taken by the size of this guy's hands. I mean, your hand would literally get lost in, in <laughs> the man. And and he was he was that kind of a guy. He was. When, when he was with Teddy Roosevelt, he was 17 when he, when he joined with Teddy Roosevelt, and they assigned him as the technician taking care of the horses for all of the, all of the uh, people that were, were the Rough Riders. He's buried in Milan on Milan Hollow Cemetery, or off of Milan Hollow. Um, uh, he, he, Jesse uh, got around. He was. Uh, like I said, he was he was a, real, a sharp guy. Or, you know, I, I knew him. I can remember uh, going to a town board meeting when when they were first putting when they wanted to put the landfill in across the street from his property, and uh, nobody knew what to expect then. And I remember Tom Odak was a supervisor in those days, and uh, he he uh, they had a, a meeting about it, like a like a hearing to buy the property. And I took Jesse to the meeting. I picked him up and we went up to the meeting to learn what it was about. And it was kind of a, a funny thing because we're sitting there and Jesse couldn't hear. I mean, the guy was into his 90s in, in those days. And I'm sitting right next to him and the meeting is going on and Odak is speaking and whoever else is speaking. And Jesse kept turning to me and saying, what's he say? What does he say? <laughs> After the meeting, you know, I was kind of outspoken too because you know I was only a half a mile from from the, the thing, and nobody knew what to expect. So I had I had uh, uh, you know let Tom and the board members know my two cents about it. And uh, about uh, a year after that, uh, uh, Tom said, "Look," he said, "You you had a lot to say." He says, "Are you interested? You want to go on the planning board?" Said, you know, he says we're, we're adopting zoning, or oh, they had just adopted zoning, and uh, you know we we, uh, we had some things coming up, especially with Carvel, that kind of thing. We were, they were developing Carvel, so he he said, why, why don't you uh, consider going on the planning board? So I said, well, what do I, you know, and, I, and in those days I was working at Indian Point, I was driving down, it was it was a long day, so I said, well, what do I got to do? He said, oh, you go to a meeting once a month, that's it, you know. 
same old, same old story that we that everybody gets. We got on the planning board, and then I got very busy in the um, mid '70s when they were building Unit Two down at, at Indian Point, and I I think I resigned from the planning board. But six months later, he asked me to to uh, what I considered taking because I guess the zoning board of appeals wasn't. You know, ZBA was uh, a little bit of a turmoil, so he asked me to do that. So I said, "Okay, I, you know, I said I'll, whatever I can do, I'll, I'll do." I had resigned though uh, from the fire department because I couldn't make all the fires because I was working. And um, I, I went to work, I went on the zoning board of appeals, and then in 1979, the tax assessor uh, uh, was sick. Um, uh, get his name. Woody he wrote Tubman, and he, he got sick, and um, he asked me to, you know, if I would go on, the, you know, the, eventually look at running for assessor in 1979, and that's what, what we did. I ran for assessor in 79, and stayed there till 2009, and then ran for supervisor in 2009. So I've been doing that. I, actually, I, I, I like living here. Um, I, uh, no, I do. I really enjoy living here. Yeah, it's and it's really uh, it's for me. I you know I it's not like I get up and say, oh crap, I got to go to work today. I, I enjoy I enjoy the. Well, I remember leaping leaners when I was like I said because I had come up here in '58 and it was going pretty strong. And in those days. The main entertainment in Leap and Lino, Lina's that I remember, because I was just sneak by the window, you know, I was like 16, I was just driving then, you know, and, and, and you know, I had my license and, and I would be driving by and Furpo, I don't know if you guys remember Furpo, Furpo played the guitar in Leap and Lina's along with Beaver who was related to Furpo, so, <laughs> and these two guys were the mainstays in, in Leap and Lina's and kind of like unwind, I guess, and go crazy a little bit would, would come to Leap and Lean. But then in the, in the mid-60s, it burned, it burned to the ground. It burned, it burned down. Eyewitness News is tracking Irene this morning. I thought everybody pulled together, uh, the, the board, what, what we did as a town board was we opened up the town hall, or it was our intent to do it, and man it, and provide uh, shelter if needed for anybody you know that uh, you know lost power or, or you know the, the flooded out you know because there were some homes that were, were pretty pretty flooded uh, during Irene and we, we uh, had the fire department here we had um, uh, the highway department and we had the town board all uh, manning the uh, the you know uh, the office up here and, and keeping the building open, taking turns, and, and I think you know we we, uh, we did a good job, I, you know, and and, and it kind of gave me the idea to turn it into a, a a disaster center, which we since have done that a couple of years ago uh, here in the event that uh, we have another hurricane, uh, uh, you know, significant size like that one. Uh, the Red Cross would come in and, and provide coverage for us now, and food and cots and, you know. The person that comes to mind was uh, Otto Frisky, who was the head of our police department at that time. And this is back in the 60s and 70s, early 70s. Uh, and the story that I remember best about Otto was, um, I used to work shift work, and I'd be working a 4 to 12, and I'd be coming up the parkway, and I would see this kind of dark old vehicle parked off the road. And when I got closer, I would recognize Otto. And he was hoping, I guess, on a Taconic to get some people speeding. And I don't know how he was going to catch anybody in this vehicle, but it was, it was pretty, for me, it was pretty funny. I, you know, but I know he, uh, he, he took it pretty serious. I think we had constables up until the 80s, you know, maybe the early 80s, and, and then it, um, you know, it just got to be too expensive, so we, we and insurance was high, so we ended up uh, using the sheriff's department. Uh, I, I, I think just the fact that, um, 
you know, I, I had some different positions in the town of Milan, um, and that I would just hope people would think that, that I treated them fairly and, and with courtesy, you know, any, any time they needed something or they came to me for any information that uh, I was always available to them. And that I, I made, I returned phone calls promptly. 